Today, I am so thrilled to be hosting a conversation with uh, Navy veteran Carolyn Johnson and author of Jet Girl, which was launched two months ago on the Today Show, Fox and Friends, MSNBC, and Fox Nation. Uh, Caroline is a Naval Academy graduate and was an F-A-18 Hornet, Super Hornet Weapons Systems Officer, where she communicated, targeted, and coordinated all missile employments in her aircraft. She was one of two female aviators in her 230-person unit and among the 1.7% of women flying fighter jets, jets in the Navy. She deployed in 2014 aboard the USS George H.W. Bush and saw combat action in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria, and was the first woman to employ weapons on ISIS. Wrapping up her active duty career, Caroline earned her master's degree and returned to the Naval Academy to teach leadership and run aviation recruitment. Now out of the Navy, she is an author and professional speaker in the private sector. Please join me in welcoming Caroline. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> so to kick things off, just so people know exactly what you did as a weapons systems officer, can you walk us through a day in the life? Yeah, absolutely. So first off, thank you guys so much for having me. Uh, and thank you, George, for coordinating everything. He is the man over here and Nikki Definitely. for <laughs> hosting me. Uh, this is awesome to be here. So. A weapon systems officer in the Navy, everyone's like, well, what's that? Number one, the Today Show thought I was a fighter pilot <laughs> and branded me as such, which I'm actually not a fighter pilot. I fly in fighter jets, but I sit in the back seat. So I'm in charge of the radar systems, the weapon systems, and these jets are highly technologically advanced. And so it takes a real person to be able to do that. And so I'm part of a two-person team um, in a fighter jet being able to employ it to its maximum capability. And so what does that look like? Um, every day, you know, it's a process. So what's a flight in combat look like? It starts actually three hours before the flight when we go to our first brief. And we go into intelligence and we have intelligence officers that brief us on exactly what we're going to go do for the day, what we're going to see, who we're going to work with. And then we go to a section brief. So in fighter jets, we never fly alone. We always have a wingman. And so that means that we have to coordinate exactly what's going to go on. So we go do that brief. Then we have a little lunch or breakfast, whatever time it is. And and we'll go get ready for takeoff. So we put on 50 pounds of survival gear, load up with our, we carry guns on us for self-defense. We carry our food, as snacks. I always carried Cheez-Its with me, was my favorite. Um, and then we get ready to go into combat with our charts and everything loaded. From there, it takes an hour to get the jet started up bring it online. All our weapons have to sync with GPS satellites, so that takes a while. We have upwards of six radios that we have to tune and program into the different um, hopping rates, essentially. So they're all encrypted, so we have to punch it with the different encryption, and then we have to ensure that they're working on the right rate so we can talk to people for the day. From there, you know, we finally get to take off, which is fun. So you go from zero to 160 miles an hour in 2.6 seconds coming off the aircraft carrier, and then you get to take off. Typically, it takes about an hour and a half to two hours to transit into country, whether you're in Afghanistan or Iraq. Um, and from there, we get to work for the day. So you get a little bit of gas from the tanker, 15 minutes, and then you go circle overhead whatever area you're trying to check out. So we conduct reconnaissance and look at the area and search for nefarious activity to protect the civilians on the ground. Um, so once you get established in combat, it, it you know it goes from there. And we're going to talk about a little bit of that and, and kind of bring it to life. Um, and we'll bring a little bit more wherever yeah. Nikki wants to take us. Well, first, I just want to take a moment. You are such a badass. That video, oh. yes. <laughs> that is really remarkable. I think, you know, just even you describing just a typical day, just like a typical day at Google. <laughs> but you really, I think, being able to visually see these videos, it's really remarkable. And I think your your contribution to, to country and service is really just tremendous. So... Thanks for sharing that. Um, I think, you know, what's a really nice segue and what I think a lot of us would love to hear more about is how you even got into flying fighter jets. Um, you know, what were even the chances of you becoming an aviator and why did you choose this path? 
Yeah. So it was funny today. I walked in and George and I actually missed each other in the lobby. He was like, I was looking for a girl in, you know, fighter gear. And I'm like, well, that's not me. I prefer pink. Um, but yeah, so I never grew up thinking that I was going to fly in fighter jets. I never expected to be in the Navy. I expected to be a doctor actually, or go into business. And one thing led to the next, led to the next. Um, and I found myself at the Naval Academy. So I was very fortunate in that I grew up um, in Colorado Springs, Colorado, in suburbia, essentially. And I had an incredible family. You know, my dad is a businessman, a commercial real estate broker, my mom, a small business owner, and my brother is about 18 months older than myself. And we grew up, you know, doing a ton of sports. We were pretty good in school and it came time to go to college. And my brother led, of course, and he ended up at the Naval Academy. And my dad goes, do you want to go too? And I'm like, ah, seems like there's a lot of rules. I don't like people telling me what to do. And I, I really don't like rules. Well, sure enough, I found myself about 10 months later in this top left picture um, as a plebe at the Naval Academy. <laughs> and uh, I think my face looked like that most of the four years that I was there. I got yelled at a lot, but finally made it through four years later um, to graduation. And so at that point at the Naval Academy, you know, I really didn't realize how lucky I was to attend the United States Naval Academy, where in our class, the, the movie about the Naval Academy had just come out. I, I forget what it was called, but 50,000 people applied and only 1,200 were accepted and started on that journey. And then only 1,000 of us graduated. And so on this next picture, um, I, I graduated on May 22nd, 2009, and was commissioned by President Obama. And I was really excited on that day. Number one, because the Naval Academy was behind me, and I was finally gonna be a free woman. And number two, because you know my career was really starting. I was going down to flight school with 374 of my classmates, to join the naval aviation community, um, where you know I would fly T6s and T45s, and I would get to fly these incredible jets, and that's really where my love with aviation began. I didn't know I wanted to be an aviator, but I really liked the people. They were great. They had incredible personalities. They were fun. They were outgoing, and. I mean, flying is kind of the coolest job. And it's like, well, why wouldn't I do that? So I joined Naval Aviation and was able to earn my wings of gold um, in October 2011. And so... Well, actually, before even going into that, um, when you think of the Navy, you think of being on, on ships. So could you maybe elaborate just a little bit more about, yeah, being an aviator in the Navy? Yeah, absolutely. So most people actually don't know that. So everyone's like, so you're in the Air Force. You fly, fly planes, you're in the Air Force. And actually, no. The Navy has a higher percentage of aviators. Actually, that might not be correct. Not a higher percentage. But we have a very large naval aviation force. The Naval Aviation Enterprise um, is comparable to the Air Force uh, in that what's unique about us is whenever there's a crisis anywhere in the world, the president asks, where are my aircraft carriers? Because a Navy aircraft carrier with her jets on board can be anywhere in any conflict within 24 hours due to the ability of the nuclear aircraft carrier to travel fast and then the air wing. And what's really important about that is that when there's a crisis, Navy aircraft don't have to get the country's authorization to take off because we're sovereign territory. And so we don't need permission from any host countries to say, hey, you know, you can take off and go in X, Y, and Z country. So we're able to do that and project power. And so that's a, that's a huge deal, which once again, I didn't realize when I was at the academy, when I selected, I didn't realize in flight school, I did not realize until we did it. And so we'll talk a little bit about that transition later. Um, from Afghanistan to Iraq, we were the first people and the only people overhead on station. And that's a, that's a really big deal. Um, and so basically what's unusual about this is I went through flight training. I got number one at every selection point, which is how I got to flying fighter jets. So the aviation training pipeline goes through and it's like a major interstate I-95 and there's off ramps. And so people start selecting helicopters or reconnaissance planes or big supply planes. And those are all off ramps, but flying jets, I continue to stay on this path and get number one, which gave me my first choice in flight school. And so I was able to make it to flying fighter jets, especially out of Virginia Beach, um, which is a very coveted location. And then 
you know, to get to that point and then be a woman in the community where there was only 1.7% women is very unusual. The statistics, if you look at them, one last thing is um, high school football players to make it to the NFL and to make it to the Super Bowl, those numbers actually relate to naval aviation. So the number of pilots in the country that are civilian pilots, private pilots, commercial pilots, that's about the equivalent of high school football players, right? And then you step up to the next level, which is NCAA, NCAA Division I. That's the number of commercial aviators, and specifically commercial airline pilots. Then you step it up to the next level, making it to the pros, uh, NFL. That's the equivalent to being a military aviator. Um, and then you step it up from there. You get to tail hook, which is flying on and off the aircraft carrier and flying fighter jets. That's the equivalent of getting to the Super Bowl and winning. Um, so if you think about those numbers, they actually relate. And it's 0.013%, I think, of high school football players, which is the same as naval aviation. So very long process that I never expected to get into, but it ended up being you know, the most amazing career I could have asked for. Well, that is a great segue into, you know, I, I wanted to ask what was the most challenging aspect within your career, but <laughs> when you describe it's it's unbelievable the amount of obstacles and everything that you had to overcome. Um, I would love for you to share maybe what was the most rewarding experience, like what kept you motivated to continue during this path? Yeah, absolutely. So. It is, it is amazing. You don't realize on the outside or even in the military how much training and education goes into being a professional officer or aviator. And so for me, it took nine years, one month, and 10 days from when I started at the Naval Academy on June 29th, 2005, until I actually did my job, which was to neutralize the enemy in combat um, on August 9th, 2014. And so it was nine years of just constant, constant, churn and constant effort and sharpening my toolkit um, to be able to get there. And so you would think my most rewarding day was getting to do my job and was getting to fly in combat and employ these incredible jets that were $80 million fighter jets with the most advanced weaponry that existed. And it actually wasn't. Um, my most rewarding job was actually the team aspect. And so as an officer, as an aviator, you're not only in charge of being an expert at flying and employing weapons, but you also have to lead a team. So you'll see, this is my team, the aviation, uh, the ATs is what they're called. They were in charge of all the electronic systems in the aircraft and how it integrated with the weapon systems. And they were incredible. And so I had two shops at that time. Um, so I had over 20 people working for me and they were amazing. And so my job on the aircraft carrier 5000 was to make sure that these people were taken care of. So just their basic needs, you know, at one point their shop which is their office that they keep all their supplies in and go to take breaks from the flight deck. Um, it was 120 degrees inside because somebody was siphoning off their air conditioning. So just basic life things like that. I would go fight these battles because they're working 12 hour shifts on the flight deck where it is also 120 degrees on the flight deck. And so to get a little bit of respite from that type of physical strain, you know, they had to get water. So whether it was getting water jugs and getting air conditioning and getting them to go to college and finish up their degrees that they had previously started or making sure that their families were taken care of at home if, you know, um, Airman C's wife had a child while we were at sea. So that kind of stuff was incredibly important to me. Um, and then you also realize what it takes on teamwork. So it wasn't about me and my experiences in a fighter jet um, and, and, you know, taking care of bad guys out there and intercepting the Russians or doing whatever we were doing. It was about the team. The aircraft carrier, there's 5,000 people on board. There's one person, the Admiral, he has two stars, he's pretty high ranking, um, and he actually had 7,500 people underneath him. And he had 12 ships and two nuclear submarines. So he's a pretty big deal. But then you have the guy who's in charge of vacuuming water out of the aircraft tie down. So on the flight deck, there's these little divots and that's where you tie the aircraft down into. They're constantly filled with salt water, right? From splash coming up over and from rain and whatever happens out there. And there is one person whose specific job it is to vacuum those out with a shop vac. And this thing came from like the 1960s. That job is critically important 
to the success of the aircraft carrier and the success of our mission. Because if that water doesn't get va vacuumed out, you know, then it rusts and there's a hole in the flight deck and we can't take off or land. And so for me, realizing that team, what it took to be able to execute these missions and to be successful at our jobs, it didn't matter if you were, no kidding, we called it upstairs or downstairs. It was like Downton Abbey. It didn't matter if you were front office or back office. Each of those roles was critically important and making sure that they were taken care of is, you know, the most rewarding part of any job, I would think, but especially in the Navy, you don't realize what it takes. So I love that. Um, I, I think maybe yeah, rooted in team, could you share maybe one of, um, your most memorable missions? Yeah. So I have been reminded about this recently um, in that Nadia Murad just won the Nobel Peace Prize this year, which is a huge deal. And she is the author of Last Girl, um, which is a, a book about her experiences as a Yazidi in Iraq. So the Yazidis are a Christian sect that ISIS believed were gypsies and essentially devil worshipers. And so ISIS was persecuting them in northern Iraq, and they were just mass killing them. And, and it is incredible. I was reading her book, and she is talking about the exact missions that we were overhead supporting. And so our goal was to protect the Yazidis and ensure their safety as ISIS was pushing them around and bussing them and, and forced them all up onto Mount Sinjar. And so I was overhead the first day of the war, as we call it. So we were, we were supporting combat operations over in the Middle East. Initially, we were in Afghanistan, and we were supporting the drawdown in Afghanistan, so pulling American troops out and turning the stability of Afghanistan over to the Afghan people. And we executed that. We supported the first round of free elections in Afghanistan, which is a huge deal. And then we supported the second round when they did a re-election, which was awesome. To provide democracy and freedom and to provide the noise overhead was incredibly important important. And so it all kind of stems back. We're going to step a little bit back. We were overhead supporting these second elections and we got a call and they called down on our radio and said, Hey, Hellcat two, three. And I said, uh, go ahead. So that was our call sign for the day. And they said, you need to return to the ship at this time. And I'm like, excuse me, I need to return to the ship. No, I'm overhead. I'm doing God's work right now. I am ensuring freedom and democracy in Afghanistan. And they're like, no, 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 you got to go back to the ship. And I'm like, I've never heard such a crazy request. That doesn't happen. They don't just call and say, you're on a very strict schedule over there. And you adhere to timelines that have been approved essentially by Congress. And so those are kind of written in stone. And they said, negative, you need to return. The USS ship actual, which means my boss, who originally had been under presidential tasking to support the elections, they had called and said, hey, change of plans. We need you back. They said, proceed south. So we proceeded south, caught up, caught up with the tanker, got some gas, and we raced home. And so we were racing down the boulevard um, with pa overhead Pakistan. We had Iran off to our right, and we were overhead Pakistan, and got to out to the North Indian Ocean where the carrier was normally parked. They actually, so aircraft carriers and ships in the sea, especially Navy ships, they operate in like a checkerboard pattern, and they like to stay in a square area. And so our ship always operated in this one square, and it wasn't there. And I, I backed out and started to search, and it was 80 miles west of where it should have been, which is a long way for an aircraft carrier to go. And I'm like, huh, that's interesting. So we race back, land on the aircraft carrier, and before the last jet had even gotten tied down or parked, the entire flight deck heaved, and we turned and pushed west at full power. And you can tell when the aircraft carrier is at full power in that it kind of shakes, and you see the... Um, the wake gets huge. Like I think about water skiing behind it all the time. And I'm like, oh man, that wake is crazy with four turbines spinning and that kind of stuff. And I go, we're going to Iraq 
because Iraq was west and, and we pushed that night through the Straits of Hormuz and we were up in the Gulf the next day. Um, and sure enough, we launched missions into Iraq that next day because the president had called and said, we now have a crisis. You know, ISIS was looking at overrunning Baghdad at that point in the green zone. And so we, we pushed up there. Um, and so Navy was the only show in town. Anyway, we had gotten there June 14th of 2014 and it was finally August 8th. We had spent 72 days at sea straight, which is unusual. The Navy likes to pull into port every 30 days to resupply and give sailors a break. At 40 days at sea, you get a beer day, which when the Navy gives you beer, you know, things are really bad at sea. Um, so anyway, it, it was August 8th, ISIS crossed a line, and our squadron was the first to employ on ISIS. I had had a long duty day that day, so I had the day off. The next day I was going in, and it was just an electric day. And so this is when the Yazidis were being persecuted up at Mount Sinjar, and so the intelligence officers said, hey, Hellcat, you're going to be up in the vicinity of Mount Sinjar, and we know we have about 20 to 30,000 Yazidis trapped on top of the mountain, and we need to ensure their safety. So we need you to patrol and see if there's any ISIS down at the base of the mountain who are going to try and push up and attack them with their tanks or with any other weapons. We said, okay, got it. So we were kind of guard dogs for the day. Sure enough, we were up searching, and we'd been there about 35 minutes on station, and we detected two tanks um, and an up-armored Humvee. And so these tanks were armored personnel carriers, and they started shooting at a village that was on the north side of Mount Sindra. And so this was a Yazidi village, and there were just fireballs going off all over the village, men, women, and children running for their lives. And so we immediately called it in and said, hey, we've detected you know, ISIS fighters. They're at a village. And they said, Roger. Confirmed it. And the tactical controller said, I'll pass it up. And so at this point, it was the second day of uh, tactical employment in Iraq, so it meant the use of lethal force, and they said, we'll pass it up. It was still held by the Secretary of Defense. So day one was the president, day two he had pushed that authority down to the Secretary of Defense, and so it was about two o'clock in the afternoon there, so they had to push it all the way back to D.C. with the time change and, and get the SECDEF up and get his authorization. So they did. And they said, you're authorized an immediate attack to neutralize and stop these tanks. They had pulled away for a little bit and were in an open field and said, hey, now's the right time to go get them. And so we pushed inbound, employed two GBU-54, which are super smart, bo super smart bombs. They're GPS and laser guided um, and it employed them in the two tanks, neutralized them, stopped the threat, and were able to also neutralize the up armored Humvee that had a big grenade launcher on the back of it. Um, and it was one of the most difficult in that I had trained for years and years and years to employ weapons and to target missions, but it was such a dynamic mission. Uh, we were able to employ on the tanks and then also employ on the upper armored Humvee uh, within 30 seconds. We were able to execute those employments, which is a really big deal. Most of the time it takes hours to set up an employment like that, um, if not you know, minutes, 10 minutes in between those employments. Um, but we had to act then because they were in an open area where there was no chance of civilian casualty. And so we knew that there were only enemy fighters out there. And so we were able to neutralize the force. We were able to save the village of Yazidis and the rest of the Yazidis on the mountain. And it's incredible. N N Nadia talks about Mount Sinjar in the book and talks about these villages. And so it's like reliving it from every day, uh, what I experienced in the air and what we were able to do to save human life was, was one of the most gratifying things I've ever done. Um, so yeah. Well, to say the least, that is a remarkable story. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I think taking it back to the title of your book, there are very few women that can identify as being a Jack girl. Um, can you talk to me about those relationships and even where the name originated from and then sort of the camaraderie around the group of women that were named Jack girls? Yeah, for sure. So 
you know, in any job, you're going to have your challenges. And in anything that you do, life's going to throw you curveballs. And and flying fighter jets was no different. Um, being a hyper minority in an elite community like that, where it has a very strong culture and sense of camaraderie, can be very tough. And I never expected it. Like, I grew up with boys. I had one brother, and then I had four boy cousins. So I, you know, I played in the mud and did all the things. I had Lego guns as a kid, but mine were in multicolored because they didn't have pink ones back then, but mine were in Sesame street colors, you know, because that's what boys did. And so I thought I understood that, but I encounter challenges and I encounter people that just because I didn't fit the stereotype treated me differently. And, and that's not easy. And so the jet girls really kind of came together. We were such a small group, um, that we really supported each other and we could, we could understand what each other were going through and provide advice and support. And so on the aircraft carrier, we had the shark tank. Um, and so you'll see our room. There was a lot of battleship gray, but there was also a lot of pink and a lot of fun on the walls. Looks so spacious. Oh, yes. We actually had the largest room on the aircraft carrier, which was nice. This was a luxury. This was our office working side. So we each had our own closet and we had our own desk that could fit a MacBook Air and a cup of coffee is how big my desk was, which is luxurious. And then on the other side, we had our bunks, which were our racks. And we only slept too high, which is we had six women in one room and it was probably like 120 square feet, uh, maybe 200. And whereas our sailors, they slept 300 people to a, to a room and they slept three high. And their only closet space was when they would open their rack up. So when they would open the bunk up, they would keep all their clothes inside of it. Um, and so we were very fortunate in that we were able to support each other and, um, it was kind of a big joke on the aircraft carrier. There were 5,000 of us of those women, the women in tan flight suits in this picture, we all flew jets. So there were three of us on the aircraft carrier and the women in green, they flew E2s, which is a big, um, command and control aircraft. So they're like the, they tell us where to go. They tell us where to get gas. They tell us where to, who to work with. Um, but yeah, we were kind of like celebrities. Everyone knew us. Everyone knew where the shark tank was. Um, they, yeah, you'll have to read into the book. We talk, talk all about, about the shark tank and like the mis mysteries that are inside of it. Um, but anyway, these ended up being my best friends in the world. This is one picture that's with Diana. It's the only time I've flown with a female pilot um, in a fighter jet. And I got to have two flights with her, which is a big deal. And so it is amazing coming together and forming those relationships through adversity um, and through this strife is hugely important. And so when you're going through an extreme team challenge, the, the ability to form those close relationships and become, you know, even more than friends with these people, family is hugely important. And then supporting each other through all the different changes in life is, is big too. So, you know, one of, one of the girls in this picture is, is married to another's brother and <laughs> is expecting a baby, but you know, that's just kind of what happens in life. So it's, it was really good to have those friendships and bonds. That's really special. Um, I have a couple more questions, but I did want to encourage if folks do have questions, you can go ahead and uh, stand behind the standing mics. Um, in the next 10 minutes or five minutes, we'll start uh, getting questions from the audience. Um, so another part of your career in the Navy was um, teaching leadership at the Naval Academy and recruiting the next generation of aviators. Um, can you talk us through that decision and what you learned during that time? Yeah, absolutely. So when I was flying, I ended up pursuing a master's degree and I was doing a master's degree in leadership, which was so much fun and so interesting because it helped me understand a lot of the, the things that I was going through and a lot of the, you know, the cultural issues or the people, you know, it's hard to understand. You're like, man, there must be something wrong with me or, you know, what is this challenge? What does this come from? And so I did this master's degree, which opened up the opportunity to go to the Naval Academy and it was the best experience of my entire life. It is totally transformed me as a person because I understood the future generations. And 
and they are tough. Like Gen X, they are tough. They are so savage. There is no one um, that's going to be more difficult or more honest than than these future generations, which is awesome. And so it really kind of opened my eyes to the talent war that's out there. You know, here at Google, you have the best of the best. We were talking about this at lunch that everyone just takes it to such a such a different level. And then you know, I met with um, the managing director of a large hedge fund this morning, and he was talking about the talent. But then we were also talking about the challenges that they're facing and, and Hey, how do we get managers who can really harness this talent and take it to the next level and open those doors and take away the red tape that makes people so frustrated. Otherwise this other company is going to offer them two X, you know, two times what they're making. And that is just a constant everyday conversation. And so to really understand these young, bright, talented people, um, and to be able to help shape their careers and get their their career trajectory launched in the right direction and help them experience the incredible things that I was able to do, um, you know, that became the highest calling. And so people are so important. You know, you're in a highly technological, obviously you're the tech company of tech companies to be with. And the things that you're doing with data, I don't need to tell you. It's unbelievable. But there's so much that goes into that other side the people side and the culture. And that has such a direct correlation to ROI and to business factors that that's become my most recent passion. And that's really what I find most interesting. So I'm happy to be here. And yeah, before we go to the question, you, I would love for you just to speak a little bit more about, so you're at the Naval Academy teaching and then your own transition, then moving into the private sector and now being able to share your experiences and be a motivational speaker. Um, you know, could you speak to a little bit, what was the, the driving factor behind that? Yeah. So I, um, I started to transition about two years prior to getting out of the military preparing and getting ready. I mean, it is a daunting to do a mid-career transition. I don't know if anyone else in here has done it where you're going from finance to tech or to different industry. It's it's a lot and it's very daunting task. And so I did everything I could to prepare. I went to, you know, all these graduate school executive education programs, Tuck, Stanford, um, it was amazing. I, I learned so much, but I also learned so much about myself because the first thing in making, you know, a huge organizational change or a huge personal change is trusting yourself and knowing yourself. And so for me, I really had to understand what my motivators were, you know, and what drives me. And so I found out my number one is individualistic, which is controlling my time and being able to control what I do, which being in the military for 14 years, I didn't have control of my life most of the time. So everyone's like, I don't know how you survive for 14 years. Um, and so, you know, I went and worked at a hedge fund and I was like, this is great. You people are, you're, the people are amazing. You know, the facilities are incredible. It's like being at Google, but it, it didn't get me going every day. It, it didn't excite me. So then I tried tech consulting and I was like, okay, awesome company, great people, had so much fun, but it, they were still controlling my life. And, and then I kind of stumbled into speaking, started speaking at a bunch of banks. And then I, you know, I've started dad tech in and I've had so much fun meeting people and, and really connecting with diverse audiences and finding what, you know, what are those connecting like fibers like. And so now I'm able to do this full time and, and just continue to do it. And so I don't know, I'm happy to answer any questions yeah. about any of that stuff. Oh, no, that's great. But yeah. Go ahead. You're so patient. Sorry. No, no problem. I, I can stand all day. <laughs> so, uh, it sounds like when you were on the carrier, you had like sort of like roughly two jobs or is one you're the, in the backseat of the jets and then number two, you're managing like a team of like the 20 technicians. Mm -hmm. So is that, do those jobs necessarily go together? Like was everybody that's an officer flying in the jets also managing? Managing a team and like what's like the rough percentage breakdown of how much time you spent on each task? Yeah, great question. And so every single person in the squadron that flies and all military officers, I would say, wear multiple hats is what we call it, um, because you always have your mission centric job of executing, you know, whether you're driving tanks or you're a military police officer or you're an infantry person, but you also have the logistical side and managing the people who maintain the jets or do the administrative work. Um, 
Um, and you know, sometimes that can get askew when you're first getting started, you know, you're probably 90% on your tactical job, learning the jet, you know, doing that. Cause that's where people are going to get killed. And then, you know, you're doing 10% and then eventually it becomes 50, 50. And as you get more senior, um, you become, you know, 30% is tactics because it's kind of like riding a bike, right? Once you learn how to do it, you're pretty good at it and you can, can keep going. Um, but, and then it becomes more the people centric stuff. So it's, it's a lot. There's three key things you need to be good at. So number one, be good in the airplane, be good at your tactical job. Number two, be good at your ground job, we call it. So whether it's, you know, leading the teams, which we cycle jobs every six months. And number three, it's being good person and being good socially and interacting and supporting the community and lo- longevity of the, of the service. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yep. Great. Oh, go ahead. You wanna, I think he was next. You were next? Okay, yeah. great. You were waiting too. Yeah. Um, so I have a tremendous amount of respect for naval aviators. I, I have some inkling of their kind of training required and discipline. It's just really impressive uh, to accomplish what you have. Uh, in 20 years from now, do you think that, um, that manned aircraft will still have a role for the kind of missions that you were doing? Or do you think that's going to be much more of drones and other types of uh, aircraft where you won't have the same kind of um, physical demands on the pilots that are up in the air? That's a great question and one that I, I do encounter quite often. So I think the role of drones obviously is going to expand. Uh, you guys are talking about it. Everyone's talking about it. Drones are going to continue to get traction and, and to take over roles that are more autonomous, that, you know, the tanking roles that we waste so many hours and so much maintenance for will all be automated. And we're incorporating technology at a rapid rate to be able to progress. What's really interesting about fighter jets especially is a lot of those roles will still continue because that man in the box um, and that decision making yes in a in a drone you can take in hundreds of you know feeds and that kind of stuff but there the situational awareness that you gain from actually you know having that the gravitational forces on your body and having being able to make those split second fighter decisions are what are so important so the difference between us and some of our adversaries and the abilities and capabilities is really the man in the box and the training and the human decision making and the fighter decision making of understanding the higher level processes and how to best employ the plane and make those decisions that are no kidding millisecond decisions that are the difference between life or death. And so in fighter jets, I think you will still continue to have live crews. And also, you know, in reconnaissance planes, my brother flies P-8, um, which is the P-8 Poseidon. It's a very large reconnaissance submarine hunting plane. And they have massive teams on board. And to be able to have that dedicated, there's something to be said about taking off and having, you know, a team of nine that's locked inside of a plane with no other distractions, no cell phones, you know, no email, no that kind of stuff. It's it's really a dynamic event. And I think, you know, given the defense contractors as well, they will ensure that the longevity of manned planes continues. So, Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Hi, I was just wondering if you could offer any uh, tips or just general advice to women facing discrimination in their field. Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks for asking and thanks for being an ally. I love that you're speaking up. So number one, I say reach out and reach up for mentorship, sponsorship, and allyship across the board because it's not a women's problem. It's all of us problem, you know, and the more we empower others that look different or sound different or are, you know, more diverse than we are ourselves, the stronger your team's going to be. And the more people are going to feel that it, you know, adhesion to the group and want to support and, and really, um, pump each other up to be a stronger team. So that's key. The, the relationships and that's the most important thing that you can do. Number two, you know, we were saying this at lunch, Stephen literally said, You know, the Naval Academy teaches you, you can do anything. And no kidding, it does. And and for every single person in this room, you can do anything. It does not matter where you were raised or what you did or what your past had in store for you. If you put your mind to it and you dream big and and you want to make it happen, you can do it. Yes, it's going to take hard work. Yes, it's going to take sacrifice. Yes, it's going to take you being outside of your comfort zone and taking a pay cut. 
in some things, but, but go ahead and do it. And as a leader, make sure your people know that if they want to make a career transition, help them because as soon as they rise up, they're going to pay dividends to you in the end. So as a leader and as these, you know, mid management and senior management, you can do that. Um, I think those are the two key things. And in these next generations, they're going to shatter all the ceilings. And that's what's so exciting to me. And so by telling them that they can do it, but also showing them the hard work that it takes to get there, that's how we're really going to continue to change. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, awesome. You're up. Hey, I'm very curious. So uh, aside from the weapon system, um, which you assume is very complicated, do we also get, we're also trained uh, in uh, uh in like taking over the entire control if the god forbid the situation demands yeah that's a great question and people ask me all the time they're like if your pilot becomes inca incapacitated would you be able to land the plane and so f-18s are actually very simple aircraft to fly they're actually weapons platforms and so um, most of the time we actually fly on autopilot so the autopilot is tuned in via basically an ipad um, and so i can type any direction in so whether it's climbing in altitude descending and i can even lock us into the ship's um, automatic landing system and so our als our automatic landing system was so precise when they first designed it that when they were testing it out, it started to put a hole in the aircraft carrier. Um, so it was hitting within 18 inches every single time. And when the hook impact point hits that many time and the times in the same spot, it literally will put a hole in the flight deck. And so they had to build error in uh, to hit within like this stage. But for example, landing on the aircraft carrier, I was a weapon systems officer. So I, most of the time I was just along for the ride. Um, but it is so precise that, so the aircraft carrier is driving forward at an undisclosed speed, right? And you're coming in at 140 to 150 miles an hour um, and trying to plant the aircraft essentially on a floating cork. The Air Force, if they're flying at night, which is what we typically do, the Navy only, we love flying at night. Like that's where we're best. Um, if the Air Force flies at night like we do, they have to have a 15,000 foot runway to land on. Whereas in the Navy, we're targeting an area that's no kidding, like the size of this stage. So 15, 30, 60 feet, um, which is just like unbelievable precision to be able to do that stuff. So, uh, yes, I would be able to get us safely. I might, you know, it depends on the situation if you would eject or what you would choose to do. Um, but yeah, there are options to, to save the aircraft and save the people. So thanks for the question. Go ahead. Hi, can you tell us about some of the more unique aspects of living on an aircraft carrier that people wouldn't normally think about? All day, every day. <laughs> Let's settle into this. So uh, the aircraft carrier life was fascinating. Um, George asked me at lunch, um, he goes, I don't know how slippery the trays are in the Navy. He goes, I don't know what it's like in the Navy. And I'm looking at my plate of food that had like beautifully grilled chicken and fresh butter lettuce and carrots. And we didn't have that kind of food in the Navy. All our meats and a lot of our prepared food was marked for prison or military use only. And I didn't know grade F meat actually existed. And no kidding exists. And when it's shipped over from the supply ships, the aircraft carrier, Sundays are our replenishing days. And they literally, so they put all the all the food out on the supply ship and they, they have helicopters that come and pick it up. And the helicopters, no kidding, do a dance with like three helicopters um, of just cycling it and then they drop it. And so like on replenishment days, no kidding, there's like cantaloupes rolling all over the flight deck and like heads of cabbage. We don't have any lettuce because the lettuce can't withstand the heat. Um, and so we have cabbage that they cut up that smells like dirty socks for our lettuce for nine months. It's like the things that you experience are just wild. There's a full brig, which is a prison with three full prison cells on board um, for when people get in trouble. It's no kidding, a full miniature city. So the laundry facilities are the most incredible things I've ever seen. And all the water is from the nuclear plant. And so it's super hot and it's steamed. And um, the there's a bank on board. And no kidding, it has bars on it, like 
prison bars, which is crazy. And they take wads of cash. Like, I don't know where the cash goes. I don't know where it comes from, but they've got that. They bring like these auto sales people on board when you come home from deployment because everyone has money saved up and they like buy cars. Like it is, it's wild. Upstairs is where the aviators live. And so we live and work on the top two floors of the aircraft carrier. So the flight deck, obviously, and then one floor below that. And so no kidding, 99% of my time was spent up there. And the only time I would go downstairs, there's 14 decks on the aircraft carrier. So the flight deck and then 13 and, and they're labeled. So the above water ones are called O. So they're O1, O2, O3, and those are above water. And then they're there's 10 that go below. And the lowest I ever got by myself was laundry, which was the second deck, which meant it was the second one down. It is so scary to go down any f- anywhere below that. That's where they keep all the bombs. And so like they, no kidding, build the bombs by hand. They build the TNT into it and then they build the fins on it and they build the seeker heads on it. But we keep all that stuff on board and we keep 2000 pound bombs. We keep massive bombs. We carry every bit of ordnance that exists essentially in the Navy inventory. So like when we first went into Iraq and we're employing ordnance against the enemy, we were using missiles called laser-guided Mavericks that were designed for the Cold War era um, conflicts. So to go against Russian tanks um, that have very thick armor. And so this was armor-piercing missiles. And so they were from the 1960s. And no kidding, every weapon has a Buno number on it. It has, and we have to log in the inventory what we're shooting, like what the code of the the weapon. And um, these laser-guided Mavericks were from the 1960s. And so no kidding, I employed a laser-guided Maverick, and it was a 1968 missile. And, like, it was amazing. So, like, we had been flying these missiles for so long. They were so beat up from just taking off and landing and flying through sandstorms. They were covered in duct tape holding them together. And then once we started to go through those and employ the first rounds of ordnance, these missiles were coming out that were, no kidding, like, pristine like stenciled with 1968. I'm like, this is an antique. Like, this is amazing. They were crazy. I don't know. The random musings of an aircraft carrier. Does that kind of answer some of your questions? It's great. Thank you. Awesome. Another question. Um, thank you for all that you've done for this country. Um, and this might be a stupid question. You obviously seem very brave. You lived through all these life and death situations yeah. and still have that sense of humor. How did you become so brave and did they teach you how to handle fear (laughs) or do you have any (laughs) that is such a great question um yeah I I was so fortunate in that I you know I was raised by parents who taught told me that I could do anything that I wanted to do and they're like oh you want to go to the naval academy sure (laughs) you can go to the naval academy are you sure you like getting yelled at and I was like I hate getting yelled at they're like go ahead go to the naval academy (laughs) let's see how this works out and I'm like oh good But so I was kind of raised like that, which is great. But in the military, I will say the intensive training and education and just repetition that you get of time after time, you know, you're going to fail, you screw up, but then they say, okay, what lesson did you learn from that? This, and, and you're never going to do this again. Right. So it's like, okay, constant iteration, fail fast. It's exactly like being in a startup or in a tech company, you know, Hey, you're going to do something. Here's the, here's the rope to do whatever, you know? If you fail, you fail, own up to it and then do better next time. And so that really creates a confidence in you that when, you know, push comes to shove, you're going to be able to perform. I will say one of the negative side effects of being in this community and being at the tip of the spear and having this incredible career, you can get a big head and you can get this personality that's almost cutting and that, you know, you, you, when you interact with people in real life, you know, that hard military fighter pilot, you get that. And so it took a long time for me to to realize that that was a really abrasive personality trait and that was really not who I was as a person. But I had been surrounded by it for so long that I had adapted that survival mechanism and and you know I I became a mean girl or I became something that wasn't authentic to who I was. And so it took me a long time to recover and heal from that. And so now, you know, I'm I am who I am and 
I'm unapologetic about it. And I, you know, people for the book are like, well, they'll come at you and say mean things. And it's just like, you know, I get it. You're still dealing with some of the trauma or some of the challenges that you faced in your career and, you know, or you're having a bad day and it's, you can't do anything to change it. So I don't know, confidence in your skill and your ability and what you guys do as professionals, but also confidence in who you are as a person is hugely important. So, so I will say before we wrap things up, we have about a minute left. Could you just share like maybe one guiding principle or value that you have learned through your wealth of experiences and as you're looking ahead to sort of your next phase? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I will say authenticity and vulnerability and understanding that, you know, everyone is fighting their own battles. And regardless of how on top of the world, somebody seems, you know, there's always stuff that challenges us and that's, that's not easy. And so being honest about that and in writing a book, writing Jet Girl, it was hard to share the good, bad, and the ugly, but it's important because everyone's dealing with it and everyone has areas of their lives that they're trying to improve on. And in the future generations, that's what they seek. And like these young up and coming people, not everything comes easy and they want to hear about that and to form those deeper relationships and to understand the struggle that goes into it. They want that honesty. It's not just Instagram filters and perfect lives. Google has some really good photo filters and Google photos, but that's not what life is about. Life is about the common human experience. And that's what I've learned is most important. And so... Well, Caroline, um, thank you so much for your candidness, sharing your story with us today. Um, at Google, we do have a veteran community that we call VetNet. And on behalf of VetNet, we do have our co-leads here. Um, I'd love to give you a Google coin. Thank and you. So thank you love so it. much again. We're just all so grateful for you to be here today and to share your story. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thank you.